Gingerbread houses have come a long way since the ones I ate too much of to make anything coherent like this back in the second grade. And an ongoing event in Sweden is one place where the best of the best edible abodes were put on display more for admiration than for consumption. Among 151 architectural achievements here are familiar landmarks and homes that radiate warmth. But there are some also more topical offerings we'd like you to have a look at. Even though the theme of this year's competition is love, what might not float the love boat is a troubled Titanic with an itty bitty Jack and Rose clinging to the edge as the unsinkable ship, well, sinks. And what says L'Amour like a gingerbread cross section of the Louvre Museum, the part where heist guys used a ladder to break in earlier this year and steal some priceless jewels. It might not all fit the bill for a classic romance, but regardless of the structure, who wouldn't want to sink their teeth into an entry that, if nothing else, is totally sweet? Lightning on Mars might sound like an early 2000s pop punk band, but it might be an actual thing, and it's the next thing we're discussing on the world from A to Z. I'm Coral Azus, welcome to the show. Six unmanned rovers, vehicles designed to roll over the red planet's surface, have been sent to Mars since the late 1990s. One of the two that are still working is NASA's Perseverance, a nearly $3 billion mission that touched down in 2021. While listening to wind recorded by the rover's microphone, a group of French scientists noticed crackling sounds. They said these were picked up dozens of times over the past two years, almost always when there was a dust storm or dust devil on Mars. And they think these crackles might be miniature lightning strikes. Their findings were published last week in the journal Nature, and the lightning they're talking about is nothing like the powerful bolts that can split trees and knock out power on Earth. Rather, the researchers say it's more like the static electricity that gives you a quick annoying zap when you touch a metal doorknob. Is there room for doubt? Yes. For one thing, no one's actually seen lightning on Mars. No camera has recorded it. And one scientist who wasn't part of the study told the Associated Press that the microphone that picked up the crackles wasn't designed to record lightning sounds. However, researchers have observed lightning on Saturn and Jupiter. And the reason it would matter on Mars, even if it's a much milder form of electricity, is that it might be able to impact electronics or spacesuits. That's something scientists will want to know for future missions to our celestial neighbor. On this date in world history! A ceremony was held on December 2, 1804 to crown Napoleon Bonaparte the Emperor of France. In a symbolic act, he placed the crown on his own head, a move designed to show he had the ultimate authority, not the Pope or anyone else. Napoleon I would reign until 1814 when he was forced to abdicate for the first time. This was the date in 1954 when the U.S. Senate voted to censure or formally disapprove of the actions of Senator Joseph McCarthy. The Republican lawmaker from Wisconsin had risen to power and notoriety for his claims that communists had infiltrated the U.S. government during the Cold War. But he was unable to prove his accusations and the Senate reprimanded him for abusing his power. And on December 2nd, 1988, a woman named Benazir Bhutto made history in the Asian country of Pakistan when she was sworn in as the first female leader of any Muslim nation. Bhutto would serve as prime minister until 1990, and again from 1993 to 1996, she was assassinated at a campaign event in 2007. Where in the world? This is a Middle Eastern nation that achieved its independence from Britain on December 2nd, 1971. You'll find it between the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman. It was established when six states, including Abu Dhabi and Dubai, formed a federation of monarchies. This is the United Arab Emirates, and most of its 10 million people came from other countries. Moving to a new place has its challenges. Missing friends back home, family, familiar restaurants, the rain? Yep, that's what this 35-year-old misses. Mohammed Sajad is from Kerala, India, but a decade ago, he moved to the United Arab Emirates, and now he works as a real estate agent. And that nation's dry climate was quite a shock to the senses when he initially moved. 
The UAE is the fifth driest country in the world, according to World Bank, averaging around three inches of rain per year. India, overall, soaks up 122 inches per year, with monsoons, especially in coastal states like Kerala, bringing waves of rain. In the UAE, most rain falls during winter storms, and in the summer, if any precipitation falls at all, it's deep inland in the desert. So, Sajad began making trips to find the rain. He became somewhat of an amateur weatherman, studying up on and following local forecasters and meteorologists. Before long, he was able to pick up on the climate patterns and signs of rain. Sajad's rain chasing endeavors have proven worth the effort and become quite the big deal. He's developed a following. Now, Sajad documents his missions for moisture on social media. The UAE weatherman, as he's known on Instagram, has over 130,000 followers. Many, like him, are expatriates. 88% of the UAE's population are actually expats, and most of those, like Sajad, are from India. Sajad's followers track when he makes a trip to find rain, and some even tag along. And what started as a private hobby has turned into an unexpected community. Uh, my intention is, like, uh, I have to bring all rain lovers who miss rain. I need to make, I need to bring all people under one umbrella. The capital of Indiana is one of the easier ones to remember because Indianapolis. That's where you'll find Lincoln Middle School, the home of the Lions in Mr. Blythe's class. We've got the Patriots of Colonia High School watching from Colonia, New Jersey. Hello to Miss Carrasquillo or Crozio's class. And we see Mr. Young students at Lawrence High School. The Bulldogs are with us from Fairfield, Maine. Ah. World of knowledge. What is believed to be the oldest charity in America? Rotary Foundation, Goodwill Industries, Scotts Charitable Society, Salvation Army. Founded in Boston, Massachusetts in 1657, the Scotts Charitable Society is said to be the oldest charity in the Western Hemisphere. Pushing carts full of cans and getting his hands dirty, four-year-old Easton is working hard to collect cash. Why? For the doggies! For the doggies! Yes, for the doggies. What started as a school project has turned into a passion project. Easton and his family have been gathering up bottles and cans, turning them into big bucks for the canine stray rescue of Oxford, Michigan. Without the help of the community and, and families like Easton, we can't do what we do. Easton's generosity is infectious. Local businesses catching on and donating to the cause as well. We've kind of dubbed it here at Canine the kindness train because it just keeps chugging along. Easton has collected at least $2,000 he'll give to the doggies on Giving Tuesday. They might be separated in age by more than 80 years, but Easton and our next role model share that giving spirit. At 85 years old, Harold Sauter, known as Coach, is a beloved, hardworking figure at the Second Harvest Food Bank of Central Florida. You're moving boxes, you're moving pallets. Um, he's doing all of that twice a week. Instead of kicking back in retirement, Harold is giving back. I'm not just going to go sit somewhere. I'm going to go try to help people. The Air Force veteran has chalked up more than 1,300 hours of volunteer work, bringing energy and big smiles to the gig, doing so alongside his wife of 57 years, Lorna, who lovingly says Harold hasn't hit a 10 on her scale. Probably a nine. Always room to improve. I'm Patrick Cornell. Finally today, we're taking you inside the lost and found department of one of Europe's largest cities. London, the capital of the UK, has a warehouse that receives more than 4,000 lost items every week. From the hundreds of umbrellas that protected heads from the London rain, to the dozens of helmets that protected heads from other stuff, there are many things you'd expect to see, a few you definitely wouldn't, and some that are hard to believe people ever lost. All of the items, including the hundreds of mobile devices in these pouches, are cataloged and saved for three months. If no one comes to claim them, they're either auctioned or donated to charity, though a few historic pieces are kept for posterity, and some are kept because what else are you going to do with a stuffed pufferfish you can't even pick up? 
from someone's chance discovery, a voyage of recovery. Finds left behind and losses suffered, gifts of lovers, gems uncovered, treasure still salvageable, shelves of wayward valuables. It's a pound for lost and found that all holds down some value still. What's dropped from cabs, buses, and pockets, inventoried on a docket, all waiting for reclamation, storage closet of a nation. I was at a loss for puns on lost and found, but I found a few rhymes to fill the time. I'm Carl Azus, means the world to have you watching the world from A to Z.